Hi, welcome to another Retronaut video. Well, this has been a, uh, as the Americans like to say, a journey. And it actually was a journey because I set off on a, what, two and a half hour drive up to Worcester, um, which may seem like quite a small drive for people in other countries, especially the US, where it's, you know, you, people drive for days and days to go to conventions. But in the UK, that's a reasonably good drive. When I got to see the hoard there, you know, all the different things that I was buying, um, in the center of it was this gem, the Amiga 4000, the machine that I had in the 1990s. And unfortunately, I had to give up for professional reasons. Um, so yeah, you know, this was kind of righting a wrong that happened in the past. Um, I didn't want to give up that machine, but, you know, uh, I was a young professional at that time and I had to practice my trade uh, 3D graphics. So I had to get a PC to, you know, practice 3D Studio on. That was just the way it was back then. I got the machine back here. I was worried about what was, you know, I was going to find when I got back here. And unfortunately, what I found was a broken machine. So when you start above an Amiga and it's it's got a black screen, that's a really horrible situation to find yourself in because you don't know what's wrong with the machine. You can't tell if it's the CPU or any of the other chips or anything like that. If you have like a green screen, then you know that you have a problem with your chip RAM and that's easily you know addressed. You might have to fix some of the RAM in the machine. In this particular case, um, I didn't have that problem. I just had a black screen. And um, after cleaning the machine and you know fiddling around and making a few changes, I actually got it to uh, get to the boot uh, screen. So I plugged in all the devices uh, and eventually got it booted up. And um, I thought I was scot-free, but then I noticed there was a problem, no fast RAM. Then obviously uh, life interjected. I had a problem with my kitchen, had to get that sorted. That took uh, quite a lot of uh, time and effort. And then at the other end of that, you know, I was exhausted from the whole mental energy of doing all of that. So I took a break from most things for a while, um, apart from work, of course. Um, and, um, and then eventually I got my energy back and I started, you know, doing more sort of retro computer stuff. And uh, I decided that I really needed to get that Amiga uh, back on its feet. So I got it down from my loft and started work on it uh, relatively recently, actually. We're in December at the moment, and I think I started working on it again in, in October. Um, or was it maybe early November? Maybe early November, yeah. So um, I'd already bought uh, the replacement octal transceiver, so I put that in. Um, and then um, I still found it wasn't working. And then a few days went by and I was busy doing some other stuff. And then my friend visited here to stay the night because we were going to go to, to work's party together because we actually worked together. And uh, during that evening, we used a new oscilloscope that I just purchased uh, just for this purpose. And uh, together, we managed to work through the problem. And eventually, we got the machine working. Fast RAM was working again. We obviously had a problem with the, the sims. Two of the sims had gone bad at some point, And that was probably giving us a false negative for quite a long time, actually. We didn't really know. And I think it was just lucky in the end that we just swapped the chips around and you know used another chip. And all of a sudden, bang. We saw the signal uh, on the other octal transceivers and we realized that the machine was working. So what are we gonna do in this video? Well, we're gonna put the machine back together. Uh, we've got all the parts ready, really. But before we do that, there is one thing I wanna do. Um, I did point out that on the CPU daughter card, there are some chips on there, GALS, and uh, they actually, as far as I understand it, do the bus um, arbitration with the CPU. I actually learned that the other day watching um, a lecture by uh, the guy who makes the terrible fire accelerators. Really interesting. And he was explaining how he had consolidated all of those gals down into one, I think, he, I think it was a PLD, some kind of prog programmable chip. And he uses that to basically uh, consolidate um, everything that he wants to have in his, uh, you know, in his accelerators. So that was really interesting that you had all these gals in the old um, CPU daughter board, but he'd actually managed to con consolidate all of that stuff down into one chip. In the old technology, those chips, whatever they're doing, they must be running super fast. And uh, a couple of them seem to have a huge amount of data going through them and a massive amount of activity. And uh, they're running really, really hot. Um, they're literally the hottest thing uh, in the machine. Um, so I didn't think that made sense. You know, there's a massive heat sink on the CPU itself, but the gals are just uh, sat there 
um, roasting away. And uh, they're actually custom programmable chips. So if they break, um, I'm going to have to get replacements for them and somehow work out how to program the replacement. So that's a bit of a nightmare, really. Um, so you definitely don't want that to happen. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put some heat sinks on those gals. And once we've got that done, we're then going to get the main uh, chassis and start putting things in. I know from taking this machine apart that it's a bit of a nightmare to uh, take apart. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be just as bad to put, <laughs> put back together. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, girding my loins and just uh, ready for a bit of a struggle with this machine. So anyway, let's not delay any further. Let's get uh, CPU daughterboard out and get those uh, gals uh, heat synced up so they uh, don't uh, expire in the short term. So during the series, I mentioned that the, um, the gals, I think they are, um, on this uh, CPU board are running hot. Um, so I did a bit of an evaluation off camera, left the machine running with a game running, I think it was Xenon, and uh, I just waited for a few minutes for the, um, the chips to get up to temperature and, you know, just to get a, a decent idea of how hot they run. And I found that this chip, this, this and this, they were the hottest ones. Well, when I say they were the hottest ones, there was a big difference, actually. These were all sort of mediumly warm, nothing really crazy going on. Same here. Uh, this one and this one were really quite hot, as was this one. This one was really quite hot, and this one wasn't so bad. This one wasn't so bad. I've got these heat sinks. Uh, they're not the right size, really. Um, these ones are actually more suitable, I think. I've got two of these, and I've got four of the big ones. Um, I was thinking about putting just the big ones on everything, um, but I actually think what I might do, hmm, I don't know, uh, obviously they're too big, but um, I do have some thermal paste here, but these ones actually have uh, sticky pads on the back. Um, I think honestly that one of the things that's the problem with these um, chips is that they have these stickers on them to show you what they are. And obviously the glue and the, um, the paper itself is, is uh, an insulator, isn't it? Um, so that's not going to be helping them cool down, really. So really what I should do is just take the um, the stickers off everything. I, I won't do that right now, but I am going to take the stickers off these four here, um, and then I'm going to put these heat sinks on. And I think I'll just use the same four large ones, actually, just to keep it looking uniform. Um, as I said, I only have two of the small ones, and as it turns out, I've got four big ones, so I think they'll work perfectly. So let's see if we can get these off. I'm going to just use a little bit of alcohol to try and give uh, a little bit of um, solvent. Not sure if this is the right type, to be honest, but anyway, let's try and get that on there. Obviously, the first thing it starts doing is removing the red from the uh, pen marks that I made. So obviously, I need to remember which is which. It's actually close to Christmas, so Mr. Robin has come to uh, visit us on the kitchen towel. Okay, I'll start with this one because it's obviously hanging over the edge a bit, which might make it a bit easier. I do have a record of these in photographs, so... And I'm sure these are documented very well on the internet as well. There we go. Now next we need to put some more alcohol again. What we want to do now is try and get these, this adhesive off if I can. It's just using a clean one, almost there. You know, there's a bit of glue left on here. Well, that's sounding pretty good now, isn't it? They're all clean. That's nice. Okay, next. Okay, let's do the uh, main offender first. Take the adhesive off. I think this is 3M. It's usually 3M. Don't know why they dominate uh, adhesive so much, but they do. And uh, before I put these on, let me just put these two little ones back in the packet. I've got these copper ones as well, actually. Um, maybe I should go copper. Do you think we should go copper? I think we should go copper. 
Let's uh, really luxuriate on this, actually. I've got five there, so I've ordered some more of these. Um, they turn up every now and again on Amazon. Um, we just need four. There we are. Oh, these come with little pads as well. I didn't realize that. Okay, so let's look at the back. Let's get the pads on. Oh, looks like it's uh, the adhesive there. Let's try and get this on here. Okay, on with the first one. Wow. Looks like a crown, doesn't it? Copper crown of glory. Or am I getting a bit Christmassy here? Just squadge it down. Wiggle it in. That looks cool, doesn't it? Very nice. Glad I've gone with copper. Really does look fantastic. A little bit more expensive, of course, but makes sense on this machine. Fantastic, we are good to go. That should protect them for quite a long time. They're nice and uh, firmly on there. I'll put these pads back here and I'll put this back into my um, heat sink box. I have actually ordered a couple of more heat sinks actually. Um, during that test, I did check out if any of the other chips were getting hot. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned previously, I can't check everything on this board. And the reason for that is that um, some of the chips are actually obscured by the CPU daughter board, and that's just the design of the machine. There's nothing really much we can do about that. Um, I'm talking about the chips under here, the ROMs uh, and the RAMZ here. I have to assume that if you had a, a massive amount of uh, RAM action going on, the RAMZ might get hot, right? Um, but I think these would never really get hot because they're, if you think about it, it's only ever sort of accessing different chips at different times to get different data. So the heat uh, uh, creation on this particular uh, area would probably be dissipated. I checked out Superbuster. Um, obviously, if you have a card here and there's a lot of data going through here, that might get hot. Um, but I have, have actually ordered two uh, 30 cent, uh, millimeter uh, heat sinks, copper. They're quite proud, actually. They're quite tall. Um, I couldn't find any ones which um, had this kind of uh, crenellation type design. They had fins, um, but they look good. Um, I've ordered those and they should be arriving tomorrow. So what I might do is um, when I finish with this, I might come back and do, uh, there's a few bits and bobs which I haven't actually got to be able to finish this completely right now. Isn't it always, always the case? Nothing's ever really completed, is it? But I do have a um, 30 millimeter heatsink uh, to put on um, here on Alice, which is the graphics chip and uh, also on this one here, which is Paula, I believe, which is the sound chip. When I left the game running, both of these chips were noticeably quite warm. Um, obviously, this is gonna be quite hot, uh, but it's obviously got a massive heat sink on it already. And uh, you might find, I suppose, these chips might get super hot if you're doing a lot of data transfer. But let's be honest, on an Amiga, how often are you like absolutely mangling the uh, IO? I don't think it happens very often, really. Um, so I don't think these are ever gonna get super hot. So right now, these four chips, um, definitely gets way hotter than anything else on the board that I could find. And as I said, the Alice and the Paula chip definitely get quite warm, uh, really quite warm during operation. So I definitely think they need a heat sink each to keep them going. But I think we're done for now. I think that's it for the heat sinks. I think we're ready to go with actually putting this back into the, um, the case. Okay, let's put this bad boy back together. It is, uh, oh, it's a very difficult machine to reconstruct, I'll tell you. You think you've got it all right and then all of a sudden it bites you and you, you find yourself having to backtrack. So the first thing we need to put in is this uh, plastic membrane. And the reason for this is that it doesn't actually use any standoffs. 
I actually thought that these were the standoffs for the machine. Turns out they're not. They're actually the nuts that go into the back of the logic board uh, for the devices, you know, the different ports. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a little bit deceiving. Before we put anything else in, I think we actually need to put in the logic board. I think that's right. Because at this point, the machine is completely clear and we've got the clearance that we need to actually put things in. So let me just get the logic board. Okay, what makes this awkward is that there is this copper uh, plate here, you see? That needs to go on there. Let me try and hold that in position. And then I'm gonna try and hold it here and uh, lower it down into position here. And hopefully it will slide in here without too much protest. Looks okay on the back. But, um, oh, I see, just needs a bit of pushing to get it into place. Let me put a screw in there, right in the center. Hopefully this one will fit. I've got a lot of these screws. They're kind of very similar. They all look kind of the same. I'm hoping that this is the right size. I mean, to be honest, how many of these would you need really to hold the board in place? It's not going to go anywhere, is it? But uh, I've got a few of them, so let's use them up. I'll make sure we have a few spare just in case at some point we find out there's something else. Now thinking ahead, I have to put the floppy uh, bay here. Are there any other screws I can get to? This one is very awkward. That one I could probably get to. So let me just put one more here. I think that'll be enough to be honest. It's held down very well. Perfect. Okay, the logic board is in, wonderful. Right, what goes in next? This needs to go in, but this, this is the actual uh, caddy for the floppy drive. When this goes in, what will it block? Block this area here, won't it, I suppose? We've just done that screw. I don't think there's anything else that's gonna be a problem there. So yeah, I think this goes in next. This is the original floppy cable, extremely long. Okay, let's get this in here. Now, before I put it in, see that there? It actually needs to slide onto that one and to hook onto that. The power supply, the opposite thing, just needs to come in here and hook on. So let's get the floppy disk in first. There we are. Now I did originally plan to put this little fella in, um, GoTech. Uh, the problem is, the person that supplied this to me, I made it very clear to them it was for an Amiga 4000, and then they went ahead and made a, um, a GoTech for a 2000. And the problem with that is, it, this doesn't have any sides on it, which means it can't actually be mounted in this uh, bay here, because the, all of the mounting brackets here are on the side um, holes here. And uh, this only has mounting um, holes on the bottom, so completely useless. They're working on a fix for me right now, but unfortunately they haven't got it done uh, in time. So that was a bit disappointing. That's why this disk drive is going back in. Okay, so that's in there. We need to put the uh, screws in for this. Yeah, honestly, this machine is absolutely a Jenga. You think yeah, you're okay, and then all of a sudden you realize that you've made a mistake and you have to backtrack and do something again. This is one of these very common screws. They seem to be used everywhere. I did wonder when I started this, why I had so many of these, where they were all gonna go. But yeah, it turns out they do have places to go. The reason why I put the floppy disk into this uh, bay already is because it's very, very fiddly. It's actually sort of halfway up. So you almost need two people, you know, one person to hold it like this and the other person put the screws in. But uh, you know, I managed to struggle and get that done off camera. Right, so we got the floppy in, we've got the, um, power supply to go in. I don't think it's critical that we do that right now because there's a lot of other stuff to do first. Um, I, I'm gonna have a quick look at the bays on the back, the ports I should say. Yeah, they all look okay. They have screw holes. The copper thing is slightly misaligned. I'm just pulling it down a bit so it fits. Let me get one of these in 
just to make sure that these go in. Because I really don't want to find out that uh, there's a mistake later. I was a little bit foxed by these because um, they look exactly like standoffs, fully enough. And I was perplexed because I didn't have enough of them. There were um, nine holes in the bottom of the case and I only had eight of these. But now it makes perfect sense because I've got one, two, three, four um, of these ports. And of course that means we need eight of these. So I'll just do one more down the other end to make sure it's all aligned nicely. There we go. That's in. We'll do the rest later. Okay, next, the power button and the front of the case and the LEDs here. Now these are all weirdly kind of related because if you don't put things in the right order, you can't actually do it correctly. So we need to put the power supply in. So I'm gonna lift these cables out of the way, get it into position and uh, slide it in. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. And then I'm gonna put I've got these four screws over here. These were weirdly missing, but I have a bag full of uh, spare screws and it turns out I had the right type. So yeah, all four of the screws from the back of the case were missing. Yeah, this was taken apart a year ago and uh, it's taken until now to actually put it all back together again. There we are, that feels better. Good. Okay. That's held in position. So next, the power button. Did I just make a mistake? Uh, no. Oof. This is what I mean. You know, you put something in the wrong order and you suddenly realize it. So that has to go like that. And that will then allow me to turn the machine on and off. I've already changed the fan for a knock to a fan. So this is already quiet. You can't even hear it when it's actually outside the machine. So once it's inside the machine, it should be pretty much silent, I think, hopefully. I've got it with a resistor in line, and that takes the power supply down from 12 volts to about 7 volts. So the fan is running just above um, half speed, and it's still producing a noticeable airflow coming out the back, and that's what I want. I don't want it to be running full tilt, making quite a lot of noise. I'm just pumping air into this machine. It just needs to provide, you know, reasonable uh, circulation of air. We already um, put the heat sinks on the, um, on the CPU board earlier, so we're good there. So now, the front of the case. Here it is. This is quite awkward. You have to put these through here, one at a time, because there's only enough room for one at a time. There is a ferrite uh, ring here, and then you've got the actual LEDs going in here. These are just push to fit. They're not very held in very firmly, to be honest. It's a bit weird. And then this is the actual lock. And um, I don't have the key for this machine. If the lock is not plugged in, it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't lock the machine, which is great. Um, I guess they built it like that. Otherwise, they'd never be able to test it, would they? They'd have to have this thing plugged in all the time. So I'm not going to plug it in because I don't have the key. I don't want to lock it. Um, if anybody in the future ever wants to uh, lock this machine for whatever reason, they can always plug this back in and uh, get it working again. So let me do a bit of a sanity check here. We've got the power cables, we've got the floppy cable. I'm actually afraid here because honestly, you make the slightest mistake and you can't put this machine back together. Um, these brackets, will they go back in? Um, do I have enough room? Yes, I do. That's okay. Yeah, that's going in there. So that's fine. Do I want to do that now? I don't think it's necessary now. So we're gonna do this next. We just gotta make sure that I've made a mistake here because it's very difficult to take this machine apart. So we've got the wires through. Now we just need to align this up. I've got the button in place. Let's put this on. There we are. Just wanna make sure that nothing is snagged up on the other side. I'm gonna pull the this ferrite thing up a bit. Get in position. The button's there. Honestly, this is a nightmare to get out once you got it in, so. There we are. It's all clipped in. The floppy disk drive's in the right place. The button works. Wonderful. Okay, and now let's put the, uh, let's put these in. Actually, let's leave that until a little bit later, um, because what I want to do is uh, make sure that I put these in the right way round. 
Um, and I do have a photograph, I believe, that shows these being plugged in. So I just want to check their orientation before I do that. Um, don't worry, I mean, obviously, with these not being plugged in, all you're going to have is um, no LEDs on the front of the machine, so that's not be a big issue for now. Um, let's put the riser card in, I think. Uh, oh, actually, let's put the, the ID in there and the floppy. So I know that both of these are keyed so that the red is on this side. Uh, so let's see here, you've got the floppy here and then you've got the ID here. So I actually want to put the, um, the ID in, in first. So this is the ID drive. There's the back, which will go here, I think eventually. The only problem is right now, I don't have a long enough power cable because Commodore cheaped out on these for some reason. Yeah, it's a real pain. Um, and I've seen other people saying that it's also quite difficult to actually get it there because of the riser card. So we'll have to see what we're gonna do with that, but I'm hoping I can get that in there. Uh, but for now, it's probably just going to hang around in the um, in the machine like this. I can obviously take the case off once I get the actual um, power connector. Okay, so let's get this in. This fits this way round. There we are. I think that's good. It's centered, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's put this over here. And now let's put this in. This bit of the machine is really congested. It's not a good design, really, this bit. And uh, before we get too far, maybe I should uh, get the power supply plugged in. Um, it is keyed, thank God. So you're not going to make a mistake, because that would be terrible. Yeah, it's keyed. I think it's this way. There we are. It's plugged in. Okay, yeah. The floppy. That looks good. Uh, we need to put this here. And maybe like that. There we are. It fits reasonably well. Stopping some of the airflow a bit, really, isn't it? Is there anything else wrong with this? No, I think so. I think we're all good. Okay, so now we need to put in the riser card. Need to make sure these uh, ID uh, LED cables are out of the way. Let me get the riser card. Before I put it in, <clears throat> let's take this opportunity to put a bit more contact cleaner on it. You can never have enough contact cleaner, can you? Really? Goes in this way, facing towards me. This is going to be difficult to go in, I know that. It generally requires a bit of uh, effort. So. It's gone in one end, I'll take it back out. Let's try the other end, okay. There we go, it's gone in. That's good. So look at this bracket, let's see what's going on here. Okay. It does have, it's not really clear which way around this should go. You know, it kind of fits in both orientations really. There is a, a space here, and the way I understand it is that's meant to allow you to put things like this through it. That's the idea. So you would put your power cable here, if it's long enough. Um, and yeah, you can put your ID cable through. Um, do I want to do that for now? No, let's not do that for now. Let's just leave this over here for now. So I want to put it somewhere where it's uh, a bit nested. Um, but we are going to look at this. Does it make sense? Do this way. I don't think it makes much difference. I think this is actually the way it should go because this lines up better with this and allows the cable to come through, I think. Um, I put these screws here for safekeeping. So these are actually meant to go on the ends here like this. Yeah, it's a bit, you know, rough and ready. That doesn't get connected to this, it just sits against it. I suppose when you're pushing it, 
gives it a bit of strain relief, stops you pushing it too hard. Right then, um, excuse me for a second, I'm just going to find out the correct orientation for these cables, and then I'm going to plug it in now because it's in a quite a hard place to reach. I want to get it done now while we can. Okay, for each of these, the connection is black away in this direction. Uh, same thing for this one. So I can see that the furthest one away is the disc. This, this is the HD, so this is the disc one. I'm just going to get this in there. Okay, position. There we are, that's good. Okay, where were we? Um, let's put these in, these three brackets. We've now got the uh, LED lights plugged in. Just going to put these in position. They're quite tight on this end, these. There's a small hole about exactly the same size as the clip, but weirdly on the other end, the hole is much bigger, so it's quite loose there. Now, do we go for broke and put the uh, G2 card in? Well, yeah, may as well. In for a penny, in for a pound. So it's literally been a year since this card has actually been in this machine um, like this. Let's see if we can get this in there. It's sliding in okay so far. Ah, oh, there we are. That went in. Yeah, that's okay there. So next we just need to put the, uh, the plate screw in here. There we go, that's held in. Now next, we need to make sure that we have some power going to this. Obviously that's the problem, you see, we can't get this over here right now. Hopefully when we get the extension cable, we'll be able to do that. This is already in fine, so I'm just going to rest this for now. And I'm not going to make the mistake that I see a lot of people doing, which is um, testing it when I put the case back together, because there's no really no point in doing that. We may as well just test it now. Um, or should we just put it on? So well, let's just put the case on and then we'll test it doesn't work, it's not too difficult to get the case off. So I'm just going to have to face it like this. Here's the case. Don't think I've left anything out. Nope, that's the right way around. Oh yeah, that's right, it has side tabs. That's why when I got it originally, it wasn't actually put together correctly. It wasn't slid in here correctly. There we are. I've got some screws here. Hopefully these will work. Okay. All I need to do now really on the back here is um, I've got these nuts to put in here. Um, so I'm just going to do that now. Just use this driver, get those done out of the way. I don't think, hopefully, there's any problem with this. So, you never know. Could have gone backwards when I put it together. Fingers crossed that hasn't happened. That would be horrible. It's quite odd, this, because um, there's a serial port here, and uh, I've just tried these nuts, and there doesn't seem to be anything in there to actually hold it in place. Ah, oh, there does on one side. Hmm, I wonder if it's missing something on the back. Yeah, it's just nothing there. I'll have to check that. It looks like the serial port has something missing um, to allow the actual um, nut to lock into it. And what we need now are the uh, accoutrements. Um, it's really not very good there, is it? Maybe that's not actually on, so we'll have to have a look at that. Maybe it's on there, not on there. 
seems to be a bit loose. Well, that was quite stressful. <laughs> I find it stressful. I don't know if you find it stressful. Um, yeah, not an easy machine to get back together. Um, I actually found when I was putting the case back on, uh, there's a problem with the tab on that side. Um, it seemed to have been bent outwards and um, there's basically a little slot here that the, the case is meant to kind of cinch into. Um, and the one over there was actually bent outwards physically. Um, I don't know why that was. The other thing I found weird was I was very difficult to actually get this to fit on unless I took the nut off the, uh, the mouse port, the left hand, um, well, the, the nut closest to the camera. Um, with that there, I just found it basically impossible to actually put the case back on properly. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it um, uh, it was just an issue at the time and um, maybe that was a common feature on these cases. I have no idea, to be honest. Um, anyway, everything's back in the box. There are some things remaining to be done. Uh, I've got a couple of heat sinks coming and I'm gonna put those on, um, I think it's Lisa or is it Alice? Maybe Alice, yeah, Alice and Lisa. Uh, sorry, Paula, or is it Lisa? That's confusing. Um, yeah, basically the graphics chip and the sound chip. Uh, they do get quite warm and uh, we may as well protect them for the future. So I've got a couple of copper heat sinks coming in, um, which are exactly the right size. I don't have them right now. The other thing I don't have is uh, an extension cable for the power supply to get from um, a normal four pin Molex to a floppy connection. When they built the Amiga 4000, they made, they made the floppy connections basically just about the right length to fit onto the floppies, which is not really that surprising, is it, I suppose. But the thing is, these days, we're using that power supply for other things. So the uh, compact, compact flash card uh, to IDE adapter, that has a, a backing plate so it can go on the back here to give me access. And um, the floppy, it needs a floppy connection um, to get its power. And I can't get that over there. It's just never going to reach. So I have to wait for the um, extension cable to come along. In the meantime, I've tucked it inside the machine on top of um, on top of the floppy cable itself, so it should be insulated. Although, yeah, I should be careful not to move the machine around too much, otherwise it might um, touch metal. So the question is, does it work? Well, first of all, we have to turn on the monitor. Let's just wait a second for that startup. There we go. Um, press the power button. You can hear the fan. The screen has gone gray. Do we have floppy, do we have the hard disk? Yeah, I can see the light going there. And I've done a little bit more work on Workbench to get rid of, there was a reference to disk hard two, um, which was actually just um, you know, a standard thing in this version of Workbench. Um, but I actually don't have a second hard disk right now. Everything is all on uh, the one uh, compact flash. So it's just um, DH0. That's why that was uh, turning up in a previous video. There we are, this workbench. Uh, let me run Frontier. We'll just let the music play for a second and uh, revel in its majestic glory. I always think there's no sound on this game when it starts like that. Ah, there we go, here comes the sound. If you ever played this uh, game on a, an A500, it absolutely crawled along. Um, this was where you really started to see the age on the Amiga 500. Uh, it just wasn't up to uh, running a machine like this, a uh, game like this. Let me just turn down the volume a bit. Yeah, it really you know struggled, and uh, this is where you needed something like an Amiga 4000 uh, or a 68030. A 68030 give you pretty decent performance, not not quite as good as the uh, 4000. Um, or alternatively, you, you needed to sort of get a, a PC like a 486 or something like that. It was just the way things were, you know, the processors had developed over the years and this was a game of the 90s, not of the 1980s, and uh, it required modern hardware. Um, even worse than this was the sequel to this game, Frontier First Encounters. That actually had texture mapped polygons. And uh, to be honest, um, Silicon Graphics Workstation would have struggled with that, I suppose. So yeah, that was just the way things were. Um, but the Amiga 4000 handles it with aplomb. It's uh, running very, very smoothly. Um, yeah, it looks really, really great. Uh, this isn't actually the end of the journey. Um, it's the end of uh, getting this machine back on its legs. I'm not sure it's 100% perfect yet. I've noticed some weird things like um, 
when I when it came out of the loft after a year, um, it was actually black screened for about three or four days, and I was just absolutely perplexed why it was black screening again, considering it was working when it went up the loft, and it was actually coming up with the um, the ROM, you know, the bootload uh, screen at the beginning, um, and then it just sort of fixed itself. That's always worrying when you get that. Uh, it could be that one of the chips in here is marginal, um, maybe something to do with heat. Maybe it's kind of odd that. The more it was used, it actually seemed to revive it. Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on there. I mean, right now it's working fine, um, but I'm pretty open to it having issues in the future. You never know. Maybe there's some underlying small problem which needs to be fixed. Um, so yeah, probably not quite the end of the saga. What I would like to do with this machine next is to obviously play some games on it, I think. Um, well, what I would also like to do is to uh, explore some of the productivity software. Um, I'm thinking about Real 3D, the Ray Tracer. Um, I never got to use that on uh, a 4000 um, with a 68040, so that'd be pretty cool. I think it's probably one of the only pieces of software I can think of where something like a 68060 actually might be useful. Apart from that, I really don't see that much of a need to have a 68060 on these machines. This is actually more period correct. Uh, this is the chip that was available when this machine came out. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see what uh, Real 3D runs like on this. I've actually got it. I haven't installed it yet. I'm still, I've got a bunch of other software. I've got CanDo. Um, I think um, I've got Videoscape. Um, yeah, all the, the sort of stuff which I used back in the day. And it would be interesting to see you know, what they perform like on this machine with um, the so, sort of top of the line machine of the 1990s. So there we are, it's fixed. Um, at least ostensibly so, it seems to be fixed, I think. Um, I'm really chuffed. I mean, it's an amazing machine. Doesn't it look beautiful? The, um, the retro brightening just came out fantastically uh, well. The keyboard looks amazing. Uh, keyboard works great. Uh, and um, there is one other thing I need actually, I need a joystick. I haven't actually got a good joystick yet, either for my um, Amiga or my Commodore 64 or uh, Commodore 128. So that is something I need to get. Um, yeah, I need to get myself a good joystick. Um, so yeah, there we are, working Amiga 4000. I really hope you enjoyed this uh, video and of course the series itself, you know, going from the beginnings, heading off to Worcester and then getting it back here. Me explaining how, you know, I basically diagnosed the problems in this machine and eventually uh, with my, my friend's help, uh, which was really nice, um, we managed to get it working again. Um, yeah, so please, if you do like this video, please, you know, click on the like button. And uh, if you enjoyed this uh, video, you probably want to see more, so please subscribe. And uh, I hope to have some more pretty cool videos like this out pretty soon. Um, the Christmas break is coming up, actually. Uh, I'm going to take a few days off, obviously, for the Christmas holidays. It's when my birthday is, um, getting a little bit older again. <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video and I hope to see you in another series or another uh, standalone video in the future. Until then, take care and have a nice Christmas.